So we'll start the afternoon session now. So our third lecture series is begin. Harvard talking about aspects of two-dimensional informal field theory. Thank you very much. It's great to be back in Boulder after 14 years. Since when I was uh, when I attended Tazi as a student. Um, what year was your year? 2003. Um, so. Um, I'm going to be talking about two-dimensional conformal field theories, uh, and let me first uh, say a few words about uh, why uh, I'm going to talk, talk about it. So quantum field theory, as all of you know, is a pillar of modern theoretical physics, and yet it is built on very unsatisfactory and incomplete foundations. So what do we know about quantum field theory? Well, there are usually three uh, path, three roads to quantum field theory that we know how to, uh, we, how to describe and think about. Um, so there's the Lagrangian approach based on some kind of path integral, there's, uh, which is what you usually learn uh, in the quantum field theory th class. There's a Hamiltonian approach, which you usually also learn at the beginning of quantum field theory class, but most people don't pay attention to this part. Um, and then there's the operator algebra approach. Uh, now, the Lagrangian approach, which is based on a path integral, um, is uh, uh, you know, formally seems to make sense in practice. Uh, is useful only either at level of perturbation theory or uh, beyond perturbation theory, only useful for certain symmetry prototypic quantities, essentially. Uh, and beyond that, uh, the only way we know how to redefine this is by discretizing. Uh, or lattice-sizing Euclidean space-time, which is very useful, but somewhat unsatisfactory because that does not make all the symmetries of the theory manifest. The Hamiltonian description is uh, uh, also, you know, suffers from the complication with the regularizing, you know, have normal order operators uh, if you try to define the theory starting from canonical quantization. So this, in practice, is also useful either by discretizing space putting theory on lattice, like spin chain models, and you take a continuum limit, or you have to do some kind of truncation on the space of states, uh, which is, in some example, it was successfully applied in this so-called conformal, truncated conformal space approach, essentially some kind of uh, rayleigh risk method for quantum field theory. Anyway, I won't talk about either of that. I'll focus on the third path to quantum field theory, which is just based on the algebra of operators. And in these lectures, I'll focus on local operators. Um, and this approach is, should be regarded as the most intrinsic approach to quantum field theory. It makes, it's supposed to describe the, the kind of essential fundamental objects in quantum field theory, which are the local operators and their quotient functions, as well as states uh, created by these operators. Um, it, in principle, should make all the symmetries of theory manifest at the level of the operator algebra. In practice, of course, the question is, can you really determine what the algebra local operator is in quantum field theory? And uh, that's the kind of thing we're after. So that sort of question is at least somewhat understood in a, uh, best understood in the context of, of conformal field theory. Um, yes? Uh, well, it's a little harder to justify the consisting of the string theory background than to justify the existence of quantum field theory, I would say. Um, well, I think the examples you like may not be established to exist on robust footing. So I, I, I'm, okay, but, but uh, point taken. Uh, so. Uh, <coughs> Um, okay, I mean, of course, uh, the, the class of theories that we actually know how to describe explicitly is pr presumably a very small, probably measure zero subset of a theory that, uh, that exists, but we don't know how to describe. Uh, part of the point of these lectures is to explore such theories. Okay, so uh, the operator algebra is best understood in the context of conformal field theories because, roughly speaking, because in conformal field theory we can do operator product expansion and with the uh, arbitrary large radius of convergence. Uh, that will buy us something, which we'll understand soon. Um, now, there's a piece of folklore in the subject, which is that uh, we think uh, essentially all consistent, that is, 
we say nice uh, unit theory, Poincaré invariant quantum field theories, uh, come from uh, RG flow from some CFT in the UV. Uh, almost always true. Uh, this has never been proven, but it's a widely accepted working assumption. And if that's true, then it's, of course, of utmost impo importance to understand CFTs before we understand more general quantum field theory. Um, okay. So uh, now uh, I'm going to focus on CFT in two dimensions. Um, two dimensional CFTs have uh, some special properties. They have a infinite dimensional conformal algebra as opposed to a finite dimensional algebra that you have seen um, this morning. Um, it, uh, I should say that uh, the level of these lectures, I'll tell you where, where I'm getting to uh, soon, but I'm going to assume, uh, I think which I suspect strongly is the case, that most of you are familiar with 2D CFT, a level of at least Polchinski chapter, uh, I mean, volume one. Uh, if you're not, I've never seen this before, you should study this evening Polchinski chapter two, possibly <laughs> chapter eight, and you have some idea. Yes? So just a question about the folklore that you were saying. That, I mean, could one relax that to saying that all multiplying something is a scalar variant? So, because it's not all scalar variant. First of all, uh, I think the question is what do you mean by a theory if you're speaking scaling invariant theories? So, by a component theory, I will mean a very precise set of axioms about the existing local operators and uh, how they create, you know. A, a complete, uh, in the sense that they can uh, create, take the operator act on vacuum and create all states in the theory and uh, obey some various axioms such as um, you know, OPE and uh, associativity of OPE and so on and so forth. Um, it's not obvious that the consistent quantum field theory in the UV gen in general would admit such a description. <coughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, and uh, uh, just as a side remark, uh, um, I think uh, if you're looking for a nice introduction to, to, to the CFT, I think probably one of the best place to, to, to and most kind of concise introduction and nicest introduction to, to the CFT is Polchinski chapter 15, which I will not assume that you have all read, but I will uh, cover a part of that, but uh, more. Um, uh, so, um, now, uh, maybe uh, before I say the, the plan, I should just uh, uh, make a few more re remarks. Um, when I was in grad school, I think the same experience happens to most, to most people. Uh, you probably have heard of a lie, and someone will tell us that uh, you know, we know almost everything about 2D CFTs. Uh, that is completely false. Uh, <laughs> I would uh, argue, hopefully by the end of these lectures, uh, that uh, what we we'll know about 2D CFT is basically a zero measure set of all possible 2D CFTs. Uh, okay. Um, and the end point is to explore what, what, what else is there. But, uh, okay. So, um, the, the rough plan of these lectures is the following. Um, so, they are, apart from setting up the basic conventions and, and so forth, um, uh, I want to spend some time discussing Virasoro conformal blocks. Uh, which uh, play a central role in uh, understanding the, the full set of constraints from 2D conformal invariants. Um, and uh, the second thing I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to uh, briefly review all known 2D CFTs. Hopefully you'll have some time for that. Um, and uh, third, I will discuss some recent work uh, on two-dimensional conformal bootstrap uh, in which we explore properties of known but not yet solved as well as unknown theories. And, uh, okay, so... Uh, Please interrupt for any questions. Um, okay, so uh, what do I mean by 2D CFT? Um, it should be a 2D, first of all, Poincaré invariant quantum field theory. Now, a uh, usually nice quantum field theories uh, that are, let's say, infrared-free, have some Hilbert space described in terms of spent by asymptotic states, 
Uh, that's generally not true for conformal theories because they're scale invariant. Um, but uh, uh, nonetheless, a 2D CFT um, admits some, instead of, usually instead of talking about the Hilbert space of states in Minkowski space, uh, we like to talk about the Hilbert space of local operators, which are related to states of theory on a circle. You have seen an example of the discussion of that this morning. In higher dimensional component field theory, the states on the sphere are related to local operators by the state operator mapping. In 2D, uh, we have uh, local uh, operators uh, mapped to uh, states uh, of the CFT on the circle, uh, or the cylinder, so this times time direction. Um, and, uh, and the basic reason for that is that there's a conformal mapping from, uh, let's say, uh, the punctured plane to, uh, uh, let's call this the complex plane, uh, to the uh, cylinder. Uh, we can write to this uh, mapping as a transformation uh, where this coordinate, let me call it Z, and this one I call it W. W, let's say, is identi periodically identified with periodicity 2 pi, and then this mapping would be, uh, say, Z is uh, e to the minus iw. And as you have seen this morning, uh, sort of the radial evolution um, on, the, uh, on the plane expanding around this, this point at origin, let's say, uh, it gets mapped to the time translation on the cylinder. Um, so whenever, from now, whenever I say the Hilbert space of uh, 2D CFT, I just mean that the space spanned by the set of local operators at a given point, which is equivalent to the space of uh, states on a circle. Uh, now, in, in fact, in this morning, I think Daniel wrote down the relation between the energy and the scaling dimension of the operator uh, up to a shift by a constant. A constant can be viewed as a Casimir energy, the energy of the vacuum state. Now, uh, in higher dimensions, because this space, the sphere is curved, you can add uh, local terms to the Hamiltonian or Lagrangian that depend on the curvature that shifts the Casimir energy. So higher dimensions, Casimir energy a priori is not canonically defined. In 2D it is because there's still a flat space. So there's no room for adding local terms to, to your Lagrangian or Hamiltonian uh, to modify the Casimir energy in a way that's compatible with conformal invariance. Yes. Okay. So, um, uh, that's the state operator, state operator, operator correspondence. Uh, uh, we'll often assume that uh, the CFT is compact in this context. And by compact, I just mean that uh, there's a normalizable conformal invariant vacuum um, over here. Um, maybe call it, uh, let's call it one in the, because it's related to the insertion of identity, identity operator uh, on the plane, which amounts to inserting nothing. Um, that assume that this uh, one is normalizable. It's normalizable state. Uh, we'll see a later example where this is not true. Um, but then the nicest class of CFTs uh, should be compact. Uh, the reason I, this is called compact, the terminology comes from thinking about um, a particular class of 2D CFTs as nonlinear sigma models on some target space. So the compactness here refers to compactness of the target space. We'll come to that later. Um, OK. Uh, so, uh, so that's number one. We need to set up the, the space of the states we're talking about. Uh, the second ingredient we'll need, just like in any Poincare invariant quantum field theory, is the existence of a special local operator called the stress energy tensor. The stress energy tensor, by construction, by definition, is a symmetric, is a local operator that's a symmetric trace list, uh, sorry, symmetric um, uh, tensor under Euclidean rotation in the Euclidean two-dimensional two uh, theory. Uh, now, of course, uh, the symmetric tensor of the rotation group um, is, uh, uh, that is not a, this is, this statement about general dimensions, it's not an irreducible representation of the Lorentz group. Uh, it can be decomposed into two irreps, the scalar and the traceless uh, symmetric tensor. Yes? Uh, we'll talk about those. Uh, but generally, uh, 
uh, we can try to think about how to prove this, but generally the expectation is that compact CFD will have discrete operator spectrum and uh, you know all the finite OP coefficients, all the nice properties like that. Um, a non-compact CFD typically will have a continuous spectrum. Now there are two different types of non-compact CFDs. One has no energy gap, so starting from where it would be the vacuum and uh, and there's, there's you know. Uh, continuum of states. Another type has a gap in the spectrum, start at some higher dimension, or goes all the way to infinity. Um, uh, we'll talk about examples of both. Uh, no, it's not normalized, but it will be, uh, no, you know, an example of that is just, just a non compact uh, nonlinear signal model. Take the free boson, non compact free boson. Oh, no, sorry. Let me let me let, let me clarify. When I say gap, I don't mean that there's a vacuum. Then there's a gap. I, I mean that there's no vacuum. The the, f the first operator appears at um, the first vector. Sort of, the first operator appears in non-zero scaling dimension. <coughs> in the, in a precise sense, a lot of these non-compact CFTs can be thought of a limit as, of compact theories, some kind of singular limit compact theories. So so we'll, we'll we'll have more to say about that later. Okay, let's explain the basic definitions for now. So. Um, uh, because this operator transforms in a reducible representation of Lorentz group, there's a scalar component, which is the trace part, and there's a trace list part. So uh, for that reason, it's consistent possibility to set the trace to zero. Uh, now, uh, this is what it means. Uh, what, uh, what in the conformal field theory, the trace of the strand and the tensor is zero. This is equivalent to conformal invariance. This is uh, conformal invariance. Um, there are several ways to understand uh, why that is the case. For example, um, if this is true, then you can construct nota currents or currents, conserved currents of the form uh, T mu nu uh, x uh, V nu of x, where, where V nu of x is some kind of vector field that depends on x in some non-trivial way. Of course, um, if it's a constant vector field, this is still conserved, but when this happens, there could be other non-trivial vector fields uh, such that this is still a conserved current that will generate, if there are new conserved current, they'll generate new symmetries. Um, the class of vector fields such that this current remains conserved, these are called conformal killing vectors. Um, and, uh, uh, and you can uh, check, as a simple exercise, that if this is true, you have some set of conformal killing vectors, such that these have extra conserved currents, therefore extra symmetries. The symmetries will extend beyond Poincaré symmetry, and these are conformal symmetries. Uh, another way to say it is just that, uh, let's say, if you can write down Lagrangian on the theory, can formulate the path integral, you can usually covariantize the theory by coupling the fields to an arbitrary uh, curved background metric. In that case, if you, uh, if you covariantize the theory, say you have some action that uh, depends on some, some set of fields and some background metric, Jimmy Nu, which are uh, non-dynamical, so no gravity, but you know, just some background metric, and if you uh, rescale the metric by a uh, spatial dependent scaling factor, um, generally uh, that will change the theory. But um, uh, if uh, the trace of the stress and the tensor is equal to zero, that uh, um, the variation of the overall scale of the metric uh, will, be, uh, will be zero. I mean, the, the, the variation of the, the path integral due to the variation of the overall scale of the metric will be zero. Uh, now, that is actually only true if you expand around uh, the flat uh, space-time. Uh, in, uh, in curved background, um, so curved, curved background, there's a conformal anomaly, which was mentioned this morning, um, which uh, uh, in 2D CFT takes the form of minus zero charge over 12 times the background uh, Richard scalar. I won't uh, need this for most of the discussion for now, so, uh, but I mean, I assume this is something you, you either know or can read about tonight in Boczynski, chapter three, I guess. <coughs> uh, okay. Um, <coughs> any questions so far? <coughs> uh, so now, um, in two dimensions, uh, well, in higher dimension, these things generate the conformal algebra. In two dimensions, there's, uh, there's infinite set of conformal killing vectors that generate the Virasoro algebra. So. In 2D, these things, in 2D, uh, the traces stress in the tensor will generate a 
uh, symmetry algebra, which is the Virasoro algebra that um, I will uh, recap in just a moment. Um, <coughs> now, uh, that's, not, that's not all. Um, as we said, uh, there's a uh, Hilbert space of local operators. Um, let's call it OI of x, let's say, at the origin. So I runs through some infinite uh, index set. Uh, these are local operators. Uh, as I said, these are supposed to be in correspondence with some uh, states of the theory. Um, this is a state uh, of the CFT on the circle, or the cylinder. Um, now, uh, in 2D, we expect the CFT to be, uh, the, the CFT should be well defined on any uh, Euclidean uh, let's say, oriented uh, Riemannian manifold. Um, and uh, because uh, the, the CFT is not expected to depend on this vial factor in front of the metric, and it really only depends on the underlying structure of the two-dimensional Riemannian manifold. Uh, it only depends on the metric on the two-dimensional manifold up to vial rescaling. And that is equivalent to say that the theory only depends on the structure of the two-dimensional Riemannian manifold as a Riemann surface, that is a one-dimensional complex manifold. Um, uh, before getting to that, uh, let's talk about the consistency of uh, uh, coercion functions of local operators. Um, so uh, one of the uh, basic uh, property of uh, any CFT, in particular in two dimensions, um, is that there's a operator product expansion um, that says if you have uh, operator 1 at position x, operator 2 at position y, um, let's say here's, there's three points, so here's x and y, you can take the product operator and should be able to expand that operator around any point, let's call it z. So you can write this as some kind of sum over set of all operators, o, i, and z. Then there's some function uh, that depends on the choice of these first two operators, obviously, uh, and also depends on i, and depends on the three coordinates x, y, z. Um, and uh, uh, by translation invariance, this should only depend on x minus z and y minus z. Uh, and uh, if you organize these operators according to their scaling dimension, then by matching the scaling dimensions on the, on the two sides, um, you will see that uh, as you go to higher and higher dimension operators, uh, these things should involve higher and higher powers of the uh, distance, or so separation between these two operators. <coughs> um, now, uh, so what does it mean to say that, uh, oh, so let me write this to be equal. Uh, what does it mean to say that th these two things are equal? So far we have introduced these operators as some abstract uh, objects. What does it mean when I say these two things are equal? Uh, what I mean is that if you uh, insert this equality into any coercion functions, it should hold, um, provided some suitable um, conditions are satisfied. Uh, so first of all, um, uh, when I, when, whenever we say uh, there's an oper operator equality in the context of conformal field theory, what we really mean is that uh, this equality holds in the coercion function. Suppose you have O1, X, O2, Y, and some other operators, let's say O3, uh, W, blah, 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 uh, you could replace this the product of these two operators by this sum, uh, provided that, um, well, a priori, if you were just talking about this equality, you know, if it holds as operator identity, it means that um, uh, if you I replace this guy by this stuff on the right-hand side here, uh, that should hold uh, whenever these uh, other operators in certain coordinate function are not at coinciding points with x, y, or z. Um, here, there's a subtle issue which has to do with the convergence of the operator product expansion. That is, if you, uh, if you have this OPE like this, and uh, so here, in general, on the right-hand side, there's an infinite sum. So if I say that this coordinate function with the, you know, uh, of, the, of this type, if I say that I can replace the coordinate function by that of this infinite sum, uh, the underlying assumption would be that uh, if I replace so this coordinate function by uh, the sum over i, you can bring out this coefficients a, 1, 2, i, x minus z, y minus z, and o i, z, o 3, w, etc. Um, 
uh, I'm assuming for this to make sense, I need the sum to be convergent. Uh, now, the sum, uh, a priori, uh, may or may not be convergent in a, in a CFT, depending on whether uh, you have, well, depending on whether, uh, 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 well, it, it depends on, uh, uh, so whether this thing converges and the range of convergence uh, depends on um, uh, where the op other operators are sitting at. So for, for instance, uh, if you take this OPE expand around this point, uh, the rate of, of convergence of OPE expansion will go as, as far as uh, where other operators are sitting at. So if you, if you draw a disk around the point Z and, and uh, this OPE is supposed to converge as long as uh, this X and Y lie within that disk, uh, but uh, until you hit the point where there's another operator. Uh, at, at the boundary, when the boundary disk meets another operator. Um, uh, but of course, if you uh, think about the geometry of this, by choosing different points where you expand uh, the product operator, you might uh, be able to turn a divergent or non-convergent OPE into a convergent one. So we'll see later that there are uh, better ways to organize the OPE expansion, rather than in terms of the separation of distances, which has a finite radius convergence in the presence of other operators. We'll be able to get around that by reorganizing the expansion in some more clever way uh, and get around this problem. And the upshot is going to be that essentially, uh, as long as these operators are well separated, there's always a sense in which this OP, um, this kind of expansion can be performed. Um, so uh, you can basically replace product operators by the sum over um, uh, single local operators. Uh, now, of course, you can, you can, you can do this. Then you, you might imagine uh, reducing the product of any uh, finite set of local operators at different points, uh, you know, doing this recursively and reduce that to a sum of single operators. Uh, and in that way, uh, if you know all the coefficients of this operator product expansion, you'll be able to determine all the correction functions of uh, a conformal field theory. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a bit of a caveat to that. So um, let's say if we're talking about <clears throat> um, if we're talking about uh, correction functions of a CFT on either uh, the Euclidean plane on R2, uh, which is conformally equivalent to the Riemann sphere by the stereographic projection, um, the, uh, so you know, if you are interested in computing some correlation function of a bunch of local operators, you try to take the OP of these two operators first, replace it by an operator somewhere, and then take the OP of that with the, the third one, and, and so on and so forth, uh, and uh, eventually reduce this to a single operator. And one can show by conforming variance that um, uh, the um, uh, correlation function of a single operator on the plane or on the sphere, at least in the unitary CFT, um, is uh, uh, non-trivial only if the operator is uh, only if the operator is itself is uh, proportional to the identity. So uh, in this way, you, you know, the computation of the correlation functions of arbitrary set, set of operators on the plane or on the sphere uh, will be reduced to the problem of determining these OP coefficients. Um, now you might wonder what happens if you put a theory on a more general uh, two-dimensional oriented surface. Um, as I mentioned, mentioned uh, it really only depends on the underlying structure as a Riemann surface. For example, you can put a theory on the torus and consider some correction function of operators of the theory on the torus, or you can consider some higher genus Riemann surface like this and study correction functions like this. So uh, what do you do in this case? Yes? Uh, that is a, uh, um, that's a good question. Um, uh, it is possible to make sense of CFT on s some class of CFTs on, on non-oriented surfaces, um, uh, but I'm going to restrict myself to the uh, to the minimal set of uh, set of uh, um, uh, well to, to the nicest class of theories. Um, um, I I would say that um, a basic reason for this is. Uh, uh, so a priori, it's not obvious that you, would, you want to be able to, 
it's not a priori obvious that the CFD should make sense on arbitrary surface. Just like it's not obvious that quantum field theory should make sense on arbitrary manifolds. Uh, it could be that uh, if you put a quantum field theory on some weird space, uh, the theory doesn't make sense. Maybe the Hilbert space, maybe the energy is not bounded from below, and things like that could happen. Uh, so, in fact, uh, an example of that is even if you take some of the nicest theories in higher dimension, let's say, equals four super mills, put it on, let's say, a three torus with super symmetric boundary condition, the spectrum is, there's no normalizable vacuum, and the spectrum is continuous. So, some bad things happen even if you put the nicest theory on the weird spaces. Um, in two dimensions, somehow, uh, there's uh, uh, two dimensional CFTs have a special property that higher dimensional CFTs don't have that allows uh, them to be put consistently, potentially, on any uh, Riemann surface. Uh, and the way it works is the following. So uh, let's look at this Riemann surface over here. Um, so uh, if you look at the cross section around uh, this loop, around the handle of the Riemann surface, uh, locally, this thing looks like a cylinder. In fact, in two dimensions, you can always find a conformal mapping locally to map a neighborhood of this loop into a segment of the cylinder. And then if you view this as the Euclidean time, tau, and the circular, circular direction as space, uh, then we are back to that picture. So you can think of that as a state propagating through that cylinder. So if that's the case, I can cut the cylinder open and insert a complete basis of states, uh, like so. Uh, that doesn't do anything uh, to the, say, the Pajin function or the quotient function. But what it amounts to be doing is that I'm basically, uh, I mean, after conformal transformation, I'm basically cutting this surface, uh, cutting it open, and insert a complete basis, which amounts to inserting some operators OI over here and OI over here, assuming that these operators are orthonormal. Um, and, uh, and then sum over, and sum over i. So what I'm saying is that uh, if you want to compute, let's say, the Pajin function or Pajin function of the CFT on some arbitrary Riemann surface, you can cut anywhere you want and just insert a complete basis. Um, and, uh, and then you reduce the genus of the Riemann surface by one. And by, you can also cut here and uh, reduce the genus by one, and then you reduce down to a sphere. Uh, and all of that then reduced to OP, OP coefficients. So uh, by this kind of cutting procedure, uh, you can determine the Pajin function or Pajin function of a CFT, 2D CFT on any Riemann surface um, uh, in terms of the data of just the operator product expansion. So, uh, the, so to summarize, and the picture I sketched over here, of course there's a lot of details to be, to be worked out, uh, the picture I sketched here is that a CFT uh, 2D CFT is completely determined by the data of the spectrum of local operators and uh, their OP coefficients. So once you know these, you know everything. However, um, <coughs> there are a, the consistency, the consistent, consist, consistent condition uh, of, you know, for the CFT to make sense on arbitrary Riemann surface like this, uh, puts some very non-trivial constraints on uh, what kind of operator product expansion you can have. So there are two essential um, consistency condi conditions, which are, um, in the precise sense, actually all uh, there is. Uh, so, so there are two um, key consistency conditions. Uh, one is the associativity of OPE. Uh, which, in, uh, by its definition, should be uh, obviously a property that, that, that we should require. That is, if you have O1, X, O2, Y, O3, Z, at three points, X, Y, Z, then you can take the OP of the first two operators first and expand on local operator at some other point, uh, and then take the OP of this with that, or you can take uh, the OP of the two and three first and then take the OP with the first operator, now, modulo some issue of the radius of convergence, which uh, at least uh, can be arranged if you choose to expand these around the appropriate domain, uh, you'd expect these two to agree. Uh, that should be true in any uh, consistent conformal field theory, but it is uh, far from obvious if you just write down some product rule like that. You need to ensure that associativity um, is obeyed. Now, um, 
roughly speaking, uh, so we can describe this in the following way. So let's draw a picture. So here I have one, two, uh, and two, three. Um, if you take OP of one with two, you have to uh, sum over all operators, and then uh, take that with operator three. I uh, want to say that that should agree with take the OP of two with three first and expand on, on some complete set of bases, uh, and then take the OP with, with one. Um, so uh, we expect that this two picture to, to agree. Um, we'll, we'll see the, uh, some very non-trivial consequences of this um, soon. Uh, in some cases, uh, just demanding the associativity of OPE is actually enough Additional, uh, no, coupled with some uh, other basic assumptions, is enough, enough to determine the theory completely. Um, uh, in, some, in some other cases, we'll see that uh, these, uh, you know, even if they don't fix the theory completely, they will impose very non-trivial uh, constraints um, on the theory. Um, and the second uh, key property is uh, the so-called modular invariance. Um, so this comes from the following. Um, if I consider, uh, uh, let's say, uh, just as a uh, random example, suppose I want to compute the partition function of the CFT on this uh, Riemann surface. And I want to be able to, so, so one way to do that is to is by cutting and sewing, as I uh, sketched earlier. Um, so you could, uh, let's say, cut in different ways. Let's say you could cut it over here. So there's a, along the circle over here, and then you cut along here, the circle over here, and then you cut over here, you have a circle over here. So what you are doing is to really, uh, w what this amounts to is a uh, pair of pants decomposition of the Riemann surface. So here you have a pair of pants like this, <coughs> uh, where you glue these two things t together. And then here you have a pair of pants like this, where <coughs> you glue uh, these things together, and then you glue these together. That's how you form the genus surface. But in this context, it's not just drawing pictures. Uh, all of these correspond to actual formula of three-point functions that can be consistently uh, summed together to give you a genus 2 partition function. But given that, uh, you would expect uh, it, that it should be possible to construct the same thing uh, by cutting it in a different way. Uh, for instance, you could imagine cutting this, uh, uh, well, uh, as a, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, instead of doing this, let me, maybe I here I can still cut over here. Here I still cut over this circle. Over here I can cut along this circle over here. And uh, if I do that, you see, after I cut it open, it's really the, uh, topologically still the same thing. Um, it's a little hard to, uh, uh, it's, uh, let me see. So. Uh, uh, well, I, I still have this thing connected to um, two boundaries, uh, you know, correspond to the two sides of this circle, which I glue together. But this way of cutting is quite different from this way of cutting. Okay, and on this side it's the same. Or I can cut in a, in a different way, or, or I can alternatively cut uh, this middle hand over here and think of this genus two surface as this thing glued together to this. Uh, and again, each of these will correspond to some three-point function on the sphere. Uh, so all the different ways of uh, uh, cutting uh, that, cor that correspond to actually uh, decomposing the genus partition function in this example as some sum of uh, um, three-point functions uh, should all lead to the same answer because you know, there should be a well-defined partition function of the CFT on this Riemann surface. Um, and uh, the fact, the statement that they should all give the same answer is a statement of modular invariance. Uh, but this looks quite complicated. But actually, um, uh, it was known that uh, you don't actually have to work so hard. Uh, it, suffi it suffices to consider um, the modular invariance of the one-point function on the torus, or the modular, more precisely, modular covariance of the one-point function on the torus. So it turns out that um, if you consider um, a 2D CFT on the torus, uh, uh, well, um, uh, okay, so, so let me just write, uh, write down something. So suppose you have some field uh, phi uh, zz bar on the, on the torus, 
where I parameterize the torus by uh, this parallelogram with these sides identified like so, on the complex plane, I write this as point zero, one, and tau, where tau is the modulus of the torus, and the phi z z bars, you know, the z is some point on the torus, uh, and phi is a field, uh, is, a, is a local operator in the CFT. So if phi uh, is a uh, is a Virasoro primary, uh, I will uh, write down the definition of the Virasoro algebra and the primaries and, and so forth in, in just a moment. Uh, but uh, chances are, if you have never seen that before, you will not be able to follow the lecture. So uh, I will I will discuss that just for the completeness of the logic. But uh, um, but I will just use this language for now. If phi is a Virasoro primary of conformal weight. Um, uh, holomorphic, anti-holomorphic conformal weight H and H tilde, then this guy here um, uh, should be a, uh, 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 which by translation variance will, will be just a function of tau and tau bar, uh, depends on the choice of the operator phi, uh, and the statement of the modular uh, covariance is just that uh, F uh, of tau plus one, tau bar plus one is equal to F phi of tau tau bar, but F phi of minus one over tau minus one over tau bar uh, is equal to uh, minus i tau to the h uh, minus I plus i tau bar to the h tilde F phi of tau tau bar. Uh, in other words, uh, under the modular transformation on the uh, modulus of the torus, uh, the one the one point function of a uh, Virasoro primary transform as a modular form of weight h h tilde. Uh, on the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic side. Uh, we'll come to this in a, maybe in a little more detail later. Uh, so it turns out that uh, if uh, this property, this set of properties holds for all the primary operators um, in uh, a 2D CFT, that is, if they, they obey associativity of OPE and they obey the modular invariance uh, to the extent that towards one point functions the modular covariance that guarantees uh, the consistency of constructing uh, arbitrary coordinate function on arbitrary Riemann surface in that CFT. So uh, basically, the, the four properties I list on, on the board in, in order, first of all, you need the operator's spectrum that corresponds to states on the circle or the cylinder. You need conserved stress energy tensor that is traceless, which generates a sort of algebra. You have associative operator product expansion, and you have modular invariance. These properties together define um, a 2D CFT, and these are the complete set of consistent relations that you need to define a 2D CFT. So the name of the game is going to uh, try to add, classify uh, and possibly solve uh, all possible theories uh, with this property. And by all possible theories, uh, in practice, I just mean all possible operator algebras that obey these properties. Uh, any questions? Yes? Uh, you can cut it anywhere. You can cut it over here, you can cut it over here, you can cut it over here. They should all give the same answer. But on the other place, you just instead have complete set sigma i i. Correct. So I have a question. What's the first set of sigma spectrum? Hold on, hold on a second. What, what do you mean by that? Because the second, uh, for example, the first is spectrum is discrete, right? Like uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> uh, uh, Whenever I say spectrum, I mean the spectrum of either local operators or the Hilbert space of, the, or the Hilbert space of the theory on the cylinder or on the circle. Okay, so uh, when I speak of a state, it's always an intrinsically, say, Lorentzian concept. So uh, uh, there's no such thing as the state associated with the torus. It doesn't exist. It's not defined. The only thing that exists is if I cut it along a loop or along a circle, there's a state living on the circle. From the path point of view, if you have a path description, you can say the state is captured by the wave functional as a functional of uh, the classical field value on a circle. They are the same. That's the point. That's, that's exactly the point. This. The state is completely characterized by wave functionals on the circle. Nothing more. Has nothing to do with has nothing to do with what operator what else operator you put elsewhere on the manifold. Nothing to do with that. Yes. Uh, well. No, no. I mean, yeah. 
uh, I, I didn't say that, oh, uh, no, I did not uh, need to assume unitarity so far, uh, but it's true that for most of these lectures, I'm going to be mostly interested in unitary theories, where I will uh, assume um, that on the Hilbert space, there's, well, the Hilbert space is actually a Hilbert space with positive definite inner product, um, which is equivalent to reflection positivity. It's equivalent to this, uh, in, in the Euclidean language, it's equivalent to the appropriate uh, positivity property of a basis, uh, of a two-point function of a basis of uh, uh, operators. Any other questions? Yes? Sorry, I don't understand that question. What, 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 the modular conformal group and what they are the same? No, no. Oh. Uh, okay, let's be careful with our language. So, uh, because in fact, this probably this confusion I think come from the confusion in the, in the language. So when I say conformal group here, I meant uh, local conformal transformations. You can ask whether the conformal transformation may extend on the entire compact Riemann surface. So those conformal transformations are elements of conformal Killing group. Uh, it is true that uh, in this case, for example, the conformal Killing group is uh, something very simple, you know, translation and then this large uh, diffeomorphism. Um, but uh, uh, that's, that's far from enough. Okay, so, uh, um, uh, and we'll, we'll see that, that in detail. But uh, um, yeah, I mean, the conformal symmetry is much, much more than just the invariance of the torus prime function under the mapping class group. Uh, this is essentially what conformal invariance means, that you have these con extra infinite set of conserved charges. They're related, but they're not the same. Uh, any other questions? Uh, correct. And uh, you can get the Lorentzian correlators by any continuation from Euclidean signature. Now, um, in Lorentzian signature, uh, let's say, suppose you're interested in current functions of the theory. Uh, in the, say in the vacuum of uh, some, let's say this is time, this is space, uh, you can always get Lorentzian correlators, the local operators, by analytic continuation from Euclidean correlation functions. Now when you do that analytic continuation um, uh, to, from Euclidean to Lorentzian signature, you have to make, sometimes you have to make a choice for two reasons. First of all, in Lorentzian signature, unlike in Euclidean signature, operators may not commute. So time-like separate operators will no longer commute. Second, uh, in this kind of continuation, you might encounter a like-home singularity when two operators are like-like separated. These two subtleties are related. In fact, they are equivalent. So when you continue from Euclidean correlator to Lorentzian signature, you have to choose an absent pres prescription to avoid the like-home singularity. And that is equivalent to specify an operator ordering in Lorentzian signature. But module that subtlety, you can get um, uh, Lorentzian correlations from Euclidean, and nice properties that you expect, such as causality in uh, Lorentzian correlators, should follow, should be uh, consequences of the axioms I've stated so far. Even for higher genus? For higher genus, you have to say more precisely what you mean by the Lorentzian, uh, by the Lorentzian correlator, and what Lorentzian manifold we're talking about. Uh, uh, I don't know too much about correlator or CFT on some arbitrary Lorentzian manifold, um, but at least uh, if you restrict yourself to Minkowski's 1 plus 1D Minkowski space, uh, the statement is clear. Yes. Uh, well. Okay. Uh, so is modular invariance required for any CFT, or could you say I just want to do a CFT on the sphere and not think about higher genus? Okay, that's a good question. Um, it's a matter of definition. Um, but the philosophy is that it's always a good idea to start with the nicest class of theories and then gradually relax your assumption. It turns out that in 2D, if you impose the modular invariance, it's actually a very strong, very, very strong constraint, as we'll see shortly, um, uh, that uh, it puts a very strong set of constraints on, on the theory. Uh, and also, if you have any uh, 2D CFT, CFT that can be described by Euclidean path integral, the modular invariance will be obvious from that perspective. Um, so, so because of the, uh, because of that, is a reasonable uh, property, and it turns out if you do impose this property, it puts very non-trivial constraints on the theory, um, and therefore we like it. Now, you can relax that constraint, explore more general class of theories, some of which do have applications, um, but uh, uh, 
Uh, for example, maybe we can have a CFD that describes 2D turbulence. I don't know. And that may not have margin invariance, but uh, such theories might have applications. Uh, well, the, 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 there are two separate things. So, so first of all, when I say a current is conserved, that's a local statement. That has nothing to do with what uh, component transformation we're talking about or what manifold we're on. Okay, so if it's conserved, it, it's the conservation, the current conservation is supposed to hold as an operator equation. That is, if you insert the, this formula into Korean function, it should hold up to contact terms. So, okay. Um, so I'm so so I, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, but uh, the current conservation doesn't have doesn't rely on uh, any specific uh, conformal transformation. Uh, that's correct. I mean, the conformal symmetry is spontaneously broken by the vacuum. The full Viasora symmetry is spontaneously broken by the vacuum. The only only uh, PSL2C is preserved, or PS, PSL2R times PSL2R is preserved. Yes. Uh, did you write what? Crossing. Uh, crossing symmetry. Crossing symmetry is the same as the associativity of OPE. Because, you see, I've already drawn the picture. All right, so if you turn this picture sideways, this looks like the crossing diagram that you, you might, might, be, uh, might, might see uh, everywhere these days. Um, it's just a statement that, um, so let's say I get some operator uh, from uh, taking the product of three operators, and then I take its Korean function with a fourth operator. That should be equal to this thing with the current function of the fourth operator. And that's the statement of crossing symmetry at the level of sphere four point functions. Same thing. Uh, okay, so that's some overview that took way longer than I uh, had anticipated, but that's good. Uh, questions are good. Uh, so now let's actually write down some formula uh, just to uh, get ourselves, get our feet on the ground. <coughs> Um, uh, okay, so uh, we're going to be working in pump complex coordinates ZZ bar um, in Euclidean space, thought of as a Euclidean plane, uh, thought of as a complex plane, and uh, the the convention for the line element for Euclidean space will be just dz, dz bar. Uh, and uh, then, uh, written in this coordinate system, uh, the trace part of the stress energy tensor is supposed to be zero up to conformal anomaly. So the non trivial components are tzz and tz bar, z bar. Um, by the uh, current conservation, uh, this thing is supposed to be holomorphic, and this is supposed to be anti-holomorphic. Um, that's a consequence of conservation of the stress energy tensor, uh, which holds as operator equation up to holds as operator equation in the sense that it's true we insert this into Korean function up to contact terms. Uh, so, so this will write as T of Z, like I mentioned, and this will write as T tilde of Z bar. So we refer to these as the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic components of the stress energy tensor. Uh, sometimes called the, referred to as the left and right stress energy tensor, same thing. Um, and now let's talk about the OPE. So the OPE of the stress energy tensor uh, with itself, so the OPE of uh, T with T tilde is non-singular. Let's not talk, not talk about that for now. Uh, the OPE of the holomorphic with the holomorphic, uh, well, um, this is the operator, so th th the entire thing is supposed to be a holomorphic function of Z uh, up to some sing possible singularity when two operators coincide. And that has to do with this statement about contact terms I mentioned uh, just now. Uh, so this guy, uh, the stress and tensor in D dimensions has dimension D, so in two dimensions this is, has, is a dimension two operator, this is another dimension two operator. Uh, so if you write this as, oh sorry, <laughs> uh, not dimension two operator. So on the, on the right hand side, um, you must have something that transforms like a dimension four object. Uh, Z itself has dimension minus one. So um, you can have things like, let's say, 
1 over z to the fourth, uh, the times identity operator, that's, that's something that is compatible with the scaling symmetry on the right-hand side. Uh, and this term could be there. And typically, the constant we write as c over 2, c is called the central charge. Uh, and then uh, you can have other operators that appear, such as the stress and energy tensor itself. If that thing appears, it has to come with a coefficient, which goes like 1 over z squared. Um, it turns out that uh, by using word identity that uh, relates uh, the, stress and the integral of the stress and energy tensor to the dilatation operator, you'll fix this coefficient to be the same as the scaling dimension of the t itself. So the coefficient turns out to be 2. And then there's another coefficient, 1 over z times partial t, 0. Um, these are the only uh, things you can build using the stress and tensor is itself uh, that appear on the right-hand side to have the desired analyticity property as well as the compatibility with conf the, the uh, scaling transformation. Um, you can try to add other things. Um, but uh, if they involve higher dimension operators, they will come with higher powers of z. And in particular, uh, if they are non-singular in the z equal to 0 limit, I will drop it uh, from the right-hand side. That's why I write this uh, sign as opposed to uh, equal, uh, unlike the OPE I'm writing over there. So <coughs> uh, here, when I speak OPE, there's supposed to be equality. That's uh, typically invo involve an infinite sum. Here, I'm only keeping track of the singular terms on the right-hand side in the z equal to 0 limit. And there's a good reason for, for doing that. Um, and, and notice that there are no terms uh, that are more singular in 1 over z. Uh, if there, those terms were there, they will be multiplied by an operator of negative scaling, scaling dimension, which will violate the unitarity bound. I haven't proven the unitarity bound for you, but as a consequence of the symmetry algebra uh, and unitarity uh, that I'll mention uh, in a little more detail later. Um, uh, anyway, you can also discuss what happens if you try to modify these terms in various ways, uh, but the upshot is that in the unitary theory, you can always, uh, up to some redefinition of the, of the operators, you can always absorb the other possible terms you can add to the right-hand side, such that this is the most general form that is allowed uh, uh, singular terms in the TTOPE that's compatible with unitarity. Um, okay. Uh, now, it's a... Uh, a standard exercise, which I won't uh, spend time doing here, uh, to derive uh, the uh, uh, symmetry algebra generated by the conserved current associate associated with the uh, with the stress energy tensor. Um, so, uh, uh, for instance, I can take uh, if I start with T of Z. Um, that is holomorphic, so I can, I can regard this as the um, JZ component of a current whose components are JZ, JZ bar. And usually if I write this, the current conservation law is partial Z bar, JZ plus partial Z, JZ bar equals zero. Suppose JZ bar equals zero, so if JZ is holomorphic, it's conserved, same thing. Um, I can multiply this by Z to the N, uh, for instance, and as long as this is Suppose n is uh, non-negative, then uh, that will still be um, uh, that will still be conserved. For for some reason, let me write this as um, n plus one. Um, now, uh, well, at, at least at, for z away from zero, uh, this you know this whole thing is uh, uh, still holomorphic and uh, therefore give rise to a conserved current. So here uh, you easily see that you have an infinite set of conserved currents. Now, uh, in radial polarization, you have some operator inserted at origin. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so normally, if you're on a cylinder, in Lorentzian signature, you have some current. You integrate the current. You integrate the time component of the current in space. You get the conserved charge, the north charge associated with the current. In radial polarization, that space circle is this circle around the operator. So if you I integrate this um, uh, current, around uh, uh, this contour, around the, the, the operator at the origin, uh, you get a uh, charge associated with that current, which we call Ln, which is a very thorough generator. Um, so uh, formally, you could say that uh, Tz, in the presence of an operator at the origin, uh, where uh, this thing might fail to be holomorphic, so it should be a meromorphic function 
with a possible singularity at the origin, it should then admit a Laurent expansion um, of the form uh, <laughs> sum over Ln over uh, z to the n plus 2 uh, by convention. Th th this plus 1 or this plus 2 here is just, I mean, th these two things are related, but this shift is a matter of convention of the, how I label the Lns, um, where n runs from minus infinity uh, to infinity. And uh, uh, this Lorentz expansion is supposed to converge on annulus, uh, you know, away from the, uh, the uh, annulus that encloses the, the origin, uh, as it would be for any meromorphic function. Uh, okay. Uh, now, uh, so these LNs, therefore, can be regarded as operators acting on uh, uh, acting on the local operator uh, as zero. So if I uh, take Ln to act on this operator. So you can think of that as simply uh, the integral of the product operator of Tz, uh, z to the n plus 1 times Tz times O of 0. And because this is holomorphic uh, uh, contour integral, you can, I can shrink the contour to a smaller contour and make it smaller and smaller, and uh, that will turn into a local operator. Uh, so the resulting uh, and so if I take Ln and act on this local operator, I produce a new local operator, uh, which I'll denote by Ln acting on O uh, at the origin. Um, so uh, that's the way in which these symmetry generators as quantum operators act on the Hilbert space of our theory. So you take a start with local operator, you do the counter integral of uh, z to the n plus 1 tz uh, on it, you get a new operator, like so. Uh, and uh, then it is clear that uh, um, the uh, entire Hilbert space of local operators should uh, form a representation of whatever symmetry algebra these LNs obey. Uh, it follows from this OPE that uh, the LNs obey the Virasoro algebra. Uh, uh, I won't uh, derive this. If you forgot how this was derived, uh, you should review Pochinsky chapter 2. Uh, later this evening. Uh, so the algebra is that Ln commutator with Lm uh, is uh, m minus m L m plus m plus c over 12 n cube minus n delta n minus m. Uh, where the c is the same as the standard charge sitting over here. Uh, let's see. Uh, there's one more thing I need to say. Um, so, uh, under the state operator mapping, which can be viewed as a conformal transformation from the cylinder to the complex plane, minus the origin, as already mentioned, um, the uh, stress energy tensor itself transforms in a a slightly funny way. Um, so, uh, I mean, this is a, a pretty basic issue, but uh, let me just uh, explain it in the language I've been using here. Um, okay. So, uh, to begin with, consider a infinitesimal conformal transformation generated by the charge. Um, so, uh, let me consider the current Jz. Uh, I'll focus on the holomorphic uh, part for now. So let's take Jz to be minus epsilon z tz, where epsilon is some holomorphic function of z. Um, let's not worry too much about sign convention for now. I just, um, but th this will be the correct convention. Um, now, uh, if I transform a local operator, suppose I have local operator as z, the point z. Uh, if I transform a local operator by the symmetry generated by the charge, that just means uh, that just means I take the operator over here and act on it by the contour integral of jz. Uh, so in the formula, this is just minus. I take some contour centered at z, uh, dw over 2 pi i epsilon of w, t of w, 
O Z Z bar. Uh, now it's a then an easy exercise replacing O by T itself. You'll figure out the uh, symmetry transformation of T under the symmetry generated by epsilon T T itself. So this is trying to be uh, using that OPE using the singular terms. The reason only the singular terms are needed is because uh, this epsilon is assumed to be holomorphic over here. So anything that's holomorphic will integrate to zero. So only the singular terms will matter because you pick up the residue. So here you get minus c over 12 uh, partial cubed epsilon of z minus 2 partial epsilon of z tz minus epsilon z partial tz. Okay. And this is associated with the infinitesimal conformal transformation, which I'll keep, I, I will represent that by a holomorphic diffeomorphism, z goes to z plus epsilon of z. Epsilon is assumed to be small for now. And then I can uh, compose an infinite set of infinitesimal conformal transformation together and get a finite conformal transformation. Uh, if you do that carefully, um, uh, what you find is that uh, if you compose infinite set of these small conformal transformation together and get a finite conformal transformation, it will correspond to a holomorphic diffeomorphism z going to z prime, which is some function, homomorphic function of z, suppose. Um, and then, uh, if you compose many of these things together, uh, you find a funny transformation property of t going to t prime. Uh, where t prime of z is such that t prime at z prime is equal to uh, say partial z prime by partial z squared times this is equal to t z uh, minus uh, c over 12 times something. Uh, so before getting to the something, so this part uh, is just the statement that if I didn't have this term over here. Um, T of z transforms as would be transformed as a conformal tensor, so I have this kind of nice tensorial uh, transformation property. But then there is this uh, shift by the central charge times a function of z, uh, which in this case, uh, if you kind of exponentiate that, you you end up with this expression, which is the Schwarzian derivative. Uh, this is the Schwarzian Schwarzian derivative. Uh, uh, let me not write a formula for this. You can find it in it's, uh, I'm not I didn't derive it, so there's no point to, to, to write it anyway. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, the only point I want to make here is that if you apply this to the special case of the transformation z going to is e to the minus iw, then you will find the relation that uh, the stress energy tensor in the w frame, which is on the cylinder, is related to the stress and tensor in the z frame on the plane by a factor like this. Uh, plus, uh, if you evaluate this, it turns out to be c over 24. Um, and um, if you now expand on the cylinder TWW um, uh, as a uh, Fourier expansion, uh, well, if, if you plug into this formula, then the Laurent expansion of, um, uh, I guess I erased, Laurent expansion of Tz, you'll find that um, these um, LNs, these variable generators, are uh, nothing but the Fourier coefficients on the cylinder, and from minus infinity to infinity, uh, of T, uh, the stress and, and the tensor in the cylinder frame. Uh, up to a shift of C over 24, which is related to the Casimir energy. Now, this is a standard, uh, standard thing. Uh, the only reason I'm uh, mentioning here is, is the following. So, uh, there's, a, there's a similar formula for the uh, anti-holomorphic component T W bar W bar, uh, W bar, which I call T tilde. So, this is some n l n bar e to the minus i n w plus some c tilde over 24 
C tilde is a snare charge associated with the anti-holomorphic Virasoro algebra. Um, now, this is in written in Euclidean signature. So if I and continue this into Lorentzian signature, I would write, uh, so in Euclidean signature, I can write W to be sigma plus I tau. So sigma is the spatial coordinate on the cylinder. Tau is the Euclidean time coordinate. If I continue this into, oh, and also W bar, the sigma minus I tau. So if I want to continue this into Lorentzian signature, I will have to set tau to be, uh, let's say, I minus IT. Uh, and then uh, the and continuation will send W to sigma plus tau and W bar to sigma minus tau. Uh, sorry, minus plus T and minus T. So if I go to Lorentzian signature, W and W bar now both real numbers, uh, but they're different. One sigma plus T, the other one sigma, sigma minus T. And if you look at this expansion, uh, you can check that this operator by the definition of the stress energy tensor in the Minkowski quantum field theory should be a permission operator and uh, on the cylinder, this component of the stress energy tensor in, in Lorentzian, Lorentzian signature, uh, which means that uh, Ln, for that to be the case, for this operator to be Hermitian in Lorentzian signature, Ln dagger should be equal to L minus N. And likewise, L bar and dagger should be equal to L bar minus N. So, so despite that in Euclidean signature, L and L bar come from, come from the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic components of the stress energy tensor. Uh, if you pass to Lorentzian signature on a circle, the theory on the circle, uh, where all of these are now operators acting on the Hilbert space, the theory on the circle, uh, in that setup, the Hermitian conjugate of Ln is L minus N. It has nothing to do with L bar. Okay, so that is important because we're going to be discussing in the unitary CFT unitary representations of the Virasoro algebra. And uh, as far as that is concerned, because the holomorphic Virasoro algebra Hermitian conjugate is still holomorphic, so the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic parts, they don't talk to each other at the level of representation theory. Any questions about this? Okay. Uh, Okay, so let me uh, uh, quickly, uh, so I went through about half of what I intend to say in this amount of time, but that's okay. Uh, so the next thing I'm going to discuss is the representation theory of Virasoro algebra. Um, um, so a primary operator phi is related to a primary is mapped to a primary state under state operator mapping state uh, still denoted by phi. Um, the primary operator has some conformal weights h and h tilde. I did not define this, haven't defined this carefully yet, but easy, it's easy to define that in the language here. Uh, primary state it is a state that is annihilated by all the LNs for positive n, such that it's also eigenstate with respect to L0. Um, and likewise, for the anti-holomorphic part, Ln bar, this equal to 0 for n greater than 0, and L0 bar phi give you h tilde of phi. In the unitary uh, CFT, um, all states in the Hilbert space can be written as superposition of descendants of the primary state by acting on it with raising operators, uh, which are the L minus Ns. So given a primary phi, uh, which is annihilated by the L Ns for positive N, I can act on it with L minus one, L minus two, and so on and so forth. And act with twice, two of these operators, and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, using the Virasoro algebra, I can always order these L minus, L minus N operators to be in, say, descending order. Um, each time I act with L minus N, it raises the eigenvalue with respect to L0 by N. That follows from this algebra. If I take L0 without N, you'll see that. 
Um, and so if I uh, take, um, so a general descendant, uh, a general versorial descendant uh, obtained from a primary state uh, would be of the form, would be associated with, uh, let's say capital N is a partition of integer N1 through NK, uh, let's say in descending order, just as a, as a convention. Um, and the sum of these NJs, say from 1 to K, is the total level, I'll call it, I'll use this notation. Uh, so from now, whenever I write little n, well in this context, it will be the level of a particular versatile generator. Whenever I write capital N, it stands for the integer partition. And whenever I write L minus N, you know, phi, uh, this is defined to be L minus N1, L minus N2, da da da, L minus NK, and you know, phi. That's, that's the definition. Now, uh, it's not hard to convince yourself that uh, these um, uh, L minus capital Ns, this, these things which I could call versorial chains, uh, form a complete basis, not orthogonal, but a complete basis of a representation space um, of the versorial algebra generated by the primary phi. So if you act on this with the versorial algebra, kind of close on themselves. Uh, Sorry? Uh, only, because, only because of null states. Uh, yeah, but we'll, 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 come, we'll come to that, but uh, I think my time is up. So uh, uh, we'll finish this discussion of the unitary representation of Versor algebra at the beginning of next lecture, and then we'll uh, discuss the uh, conformal block decomposition of uh, coordinate functions. Uh,